Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. And on behalf of KPMG and Ireland Economics, I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Cronin. Andy is the CEO of Avalon. He's joining us for the purposes of our Aviation Leaders Report. And I should say we're recording this in early December. Andy, thanks so much for joining us. Um, before we get into kind of the meat of the conversation, uh, first off, congratulations on your appointment as CEO. Um, can you tell our watchers, one, a little bit about Avalon, and two, how are you enjoying the new role? Well, uh, I'll deal with the second one first. Uh, loving the role, uh, really exciting. Uh, and actually, you know what, the timing of the transition uh, of my appointment into chief executive role coincided with just a load of activity in the market. So Asia reawoke uh, out of its COVID uh, stupor, I guess. And uh, also, uh, there's been so much activity in terms of placement of aircraft, uh, movement in financing rates, movement in portfolios, movement in what different lessors are trying to do, and enabled a lot of movement in the organization. So there's been a lot of activity. You can feel the energy level in the industry. You can feel the energy level in the organization. Uh, so that's been fantastic. Uh, in terms of what is Avalon, uh, Avalon's one of the largest aircraft leasing companies in the world. Uh, started in 2010. Grown from there, uh, we were a public company in New York uh, for a, a period of time before a take private. A subsequent acquisition of two large leasing companies, Hong Kong Aviation Capital and CIT, uh, which propelled us to be one of the, the top three leasing companies in the world. And Andy, given that breadth you have over the market, um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you saw the recovery progress during 2022 and, and in particular kind of differences you've seen in the various geographies you operate? Yeah, absolutely. Again, a really interesting one and real differences in different parts of the world. So the US uh, was the first to reopen in 2021. Europe lagged and Europe was about three or four months behind the States because of a slower vaccine rollout, which uh, a lot of viewers will probably recall. Um, but then by autumn uh, into winter, Europe was well established on its recovery path. And what we saw then was Asia get going almost a full year behind the US. So my first trip to Asia uh, since COVID was actually the Singapore Air Show in February. And again, I'm sure a number of viewers uh, will recall that first trip and the, you know, bureaucracy and logistics of actually getting a visa exemption to get there, the COVID testing, uh, the track and trace apps, uh, the testing before you went into the conference venues, the air show venues, etc. But Singapore really led the way with its vaccinated travel lanes uh, to, to various key connectivity hubs. And what has happened since then is a pretty steady uh, reopening of Asia. And what we're seeing now is a real resurgence in activity and a lot of the uh, friction costs like COVID testing, et cetera, has now been dropped. So for example, Japan, the most recent uh, to drop its COVID ent testing entry requirements. And actually what that translated to is we saw a direct read through into aircraft demand. Once that testing requirement dropped, there was instantaneous demand for aircraft to get aircraft back on routes and to serve the market because there is a huge pent up demand for air travel. China uh, is one which has operated differently, perhaps to the rest of the world. And people actually forget that for the past two years, the domestic market in China was actually operating at pretty close to pre-COVID levels throughout that two year period. And it's only really in the past three to six months where that's been more heavily disrupted as more contagious variants uh, went into China. This morning, actually, we've seen uh, a big easing in restrictions in China. We are seeing increased international traffic in and out of China, but it is quite slow at the moment. So we hope to see that uh, reactivate and begin to uh, trend towards normality uh, over the coming months. What we have seen time and time again in every single jurisdiction that has reopened, the US, then Europe, then Asia, is there's a, a line of that recovery graph. The slope of that is not determined by people wanting to travel. The slope of that graph is how quickly can they get planes and crews back into the air in those markets. And that's creating uh, enormous demand for near-term availability for aircraft. And that probably speaks to lots of opportunities in the market, Andy. And as you look out into 23, where are you focusing on from an opportunities perspective? 
Well, we, we have a multi-channel business model. So we operate in the sale leaseback market. We operate in the placement market. We have a large order book. We have a large amount of aircraft available through our ordinary course roll-off. Uh, where we see opportunities is actually for, for uh, it, it sounds uh, uh, maybe a little um, complacent, but we actually see opportunities right across uh, the universe of those products. We see airlines with demand for capital. There have been disruption to normal financing channels and financing costs. Uh, from our perspective, our business is well positioned, very low debt to equity, high levels of liquidity, et cetera. Um, and uh, so we really uh, do see that there's an opportunity to both deploy new capital, but also uh, deploy aircraft in a more accretive way over the coming year. And the reality is that for the past year, probably about 50% of our placement activity was actually into Europe. Uh, we see that r returning to trend now, where one in every two new aircraft is heading into Asia. And we see more and more demand for new and used aircraft in Asia as they try to recover their networks as quickly as possible. So that's a load of opportunities and a load of positives. In focusing at some of the uncertainty that's there, so if we look at the macroeconomic and geopolitical environment, um, we obviously have the Russian invasion, which had a significant aviation impact and a bit of an overhang. We have interest rates, FX rates, oil and inflation. How challenging is it making these medium-term plans with that level of uncertainty in the macro environment? Yeah, so first of all, anything which disrupts global trade, globalization, or people's ability to travel isn't a helpful backdrop uh, for our industry. However, what we have learned through COVID was, you know, there was all the speculation of, are people going to stop traveling and just do everything by Zoom? Are, are, are they going to, to do the Christmas dinner by, by Teams, right? Uh, the answer to that is emphatically proven and emphatically, no, people want to travel. So at its core, people will still want to move around the world. Geopolitical issues are real. They are more present than we have seen, uh, certainly in the recent past. Um, that creates a real change in the risk assessment for lessors around how you're looking at different jurisdictions that you're doing business in. It also creates opportunity where some traditional markets may actually be more attractive now uh, compared to previously. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, however, in general, we believe that the world's long-term trend towards globalization, people traveling, will continue, and our industry will continue to play a hugely important part uh, in that journey. Uh, in terms of the impact on interest rates and so on, uh, you know, to be honest, I think that's pretty mild. I think aircraft lessors think in multi-decade phases, right? I mean, we, we invest in long-term assets, we're long-term holders of assets, and long, as a result, uh, all of the large lessors are long-term financiers as well. And we've all seen interest rates be much higher than this. Actually, uh, you know, the 10-year swap today is 3.5%. That's not a high interest rate, it's higher than it was, um, but it's still much lower than you know, the early to mid 2000s and even up to 2008. Um, so really we were in unprecedented territory where rates were heading to zero or negative and we're much more comfortable underwriting new business in what I would term a medium interest rate environment like we have today than actually when rates are zero. Um, where some people in our industry may get caught is those people who were short-term financed and bridging to an exit. Right? So people have to have the ability to withstand a period of time and a readjustment in lease rates to get through uh, the cycle that may cause isolated pressure points. It won't change, in my view, the big players' uh, outlook. And then the other uh, perspective on interest rates is that actually it's driven because of inflation. And inflation is good for asset owners and our businesses all own real assets. So actually we see this as being net-net, much more positive environment than we were in a year or two years ago from an inflation and interest rate environment. Maybe the, the, the balance to that or the concern is where I get nervous is just looking at how quickly things changed. And you have to go back 40 years 
to find a time when interest rates changed as quickly as they have done this year. And when you see things like a, a 20% drop in the value of the euro versus the, the dollar, that, that's an example of the fairly rapid shift that can happen. We saw the UK government have to intervene uh, to, to support the gilt market because of pension fund liabilities. People didn't know that that risk was there and it got identified and isolated because of that sudden move in the markets. So where we'd be a little bit concerned is maybe around some of the emerging markets where these kinds of large moves and volatility do cause a period of recalibration and often lead to something breaking. That's obvious in hindsight, but people don't know about until it actually breaks. Can, can I pull up a couple of threads that you mentioned there, probably around inflation and lease rate factors? So the logical uh, extension of an increased rate environment is, is clearly uh, an LRF increase. Always been a bit of a lag, right? So can I get your perspectives on, on how that lease rate factor is moving in this market? And two, are you seeing that correlation to inflation and asset prices yet? I think we are seeing a correlation in asset prices. So we expect appraisers to put a higher level of inflation on aircraft values over year end than we've seen in the recent past, as in decade. Um, we're also seeing particular inflation and have done for a number of years actually in the maintenance cost for engines, particularly. And that's actually quite a large component of aircraft value. So if you think about your full life or your half life aircraft as including a large component of engine maintenance cost and engine maintenance value, then we've been seeing pretty consistent inflation actually over the past decade, which has compensated for a lack of pure stereotypical airframe inflation. In terms of lease rate factors, uh, first of all, lessors finance for the long term and have a long lease tail. Uh, secondly, airlines don't go and finance aircraft that are delivering today. They don't go and finance that this morning. Okay, there's a lead time here in terms of the flow of transactions into the market and RFPs. And I think you have to separate out as well the interest rate dynamic. There's swap rates and then there's spreads and borrowing costs. Both of those have gone up. In terms of the swap rates for new deliveries, that's feeding directly through most of the large lessors for most of their leases have built in interest rate escalators. And so if an aircraft is delivering today, it's paid, the rental gets pegged off swap rates today. So that's a fairly instantaneous effect. In terms of a shift in spreads and a shift in the cost of capital for the sector and the relative value that this sector offers relative to other asset classes, that takes more time because that only feeds in as airlines look to build out RFPs for upcoming deliveries. And most airlines would operate like lessors of having financing in place for 12 to 18 months lead time ahead of the actual delivery. So we see that starting to emerge now. I think also with the rate volatility that came in over August, September, October, um, everyone who was thinking about raising capital, if they could, they sort of sat on their hands. Right, they sat on the sidelines and waited to see if this would be a short-term issue or where, where does stability hit. And I think we're now at that point where you're starting to see lessors go back to the bond market. You're starting to see airlines now come to the market for RFPs, accepting that, okay, this is now a base case level of stability for the next period of time and they got to get on and do whatever financing they got to get done. So I think the next three to four months will be really interesting. The Dublin Air Finance Conference and Airline Economics Conference may well be a time when we can actually uh, get a better read on the market in terms of flow of activity. Yeah, and to, 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 to pull on a couple of those points, right? So your thoughts on, on, on the bond market, and obviously you know, lessors like yourselves fill their boots very, very effectively in that low rate environment. Um, as a correlation, we've seen very few issuances and the volatility you spoke to. As the IG rated lessors go back to that market, do you think there's any challenges around the, the price they will pay for debt? Not, obviously, it'll be more expensive given the increased rate environment. I guess my question comes back to the asset class point. Do you think aviation as an asset class will be negatively impacted from a bond perspective, or do you think it's matured so well and showed its resilience that look, you'll pay the premium on the increased rate, but you'll operate similar to you did before? 
Yeah, I think it's firmly the latter. So I think if you look at the shock that aircraft leasing has come through, okay, so it's come through COVID, a two-year shutdown has come through Russia, and it's come through an interest rate, let's call it a shock, although it's not that big a shock. Um, our business has operated organically through that period, okay, so, you know, no equity injections from shareholders, no M&A to change the picture. So it's a like-for-like -like comparison. Every single credit metric is better. Our debt to equity is lower, our liquidity is higher, our sources to uses is higher. Um, the cash generation is actually higher this year than 2019. So, you know, from that perspective, uh, I think it's proven from a bondholder perspective uh, that these businesses are robust, that they can actually withstand very, very significant shock. One of the rating agencies actually described the past two years as having been the equivalent of a double A rating level of shock uh, to a business. And all of the large lessors have come through that really, really well. Um, so I think that from a bondholder perspective, that's really reassuring. Uh, I think the rating agencies are also starting to, to take notice of that. Some of the questions are around you know, when do you start to reflect that in higher ratings for the group as a whole relative to other asset classes? You look at the stability of lessor ratings versus airline ratings through the pandemic, and it's very stark. No airline was downgraded, or no lessor was downgraded. Um, so I think that's a really interesting question around a repositioning of the sector actually into a, a higher rating bracket post-pandemic. Uh, the other side of that, though, is the equity side. And I think that's where equity returns have been hit. And equity investors, I think, are, are fatigued by that succession of shocks and also, frankly, are starting to see better relative value elsewhere. So I think in particular for US investors, for the non-strategic investors, uh, there may be I would say alternative choices available to those investors to deploy capital in what they perceive as a less volatile area, because really it was equity investors took the volatility through the past two years. And on that investor side, you know, maybe taking the lens of you know, pre and post COVID, have you seen any evolution in the nature of investors coming to aviation finance? You, know, you mentioned at the start that you know, the, the history you guys have had, currently you're backed by Chinese and Japanese capital, you've been listed, you've done lots of ABS, you've seen the investor market. Uh, is it still the same types of investors, the names change, or have you seen any interesting trends on the investor side? Yeah, it, it has definitely changed. Uh, I, I think certainly in the period 2013 through 2019, there was a lot of, I would say, mid, mid to small scale platforms who were entering the market. Some of them propelled by very cheap access to liquidity. Uh, also able to get access to order books uh, with relative ease. That has changed now so that there's been a, quite a bit of consolidation around that level of that small to mid-scale platform, the people who had small order books, but they had a disproportionate impact on their ability to actually distort market rentals. So that behavior has changed. Uh, and again, I think in some cases, that's fatigue on the shareholder part uh, coming through the cycle. Uh, we have seen an impact in terms of some of the private uh, but US liquid fund, the insurance company type money, choosing to put their capital elsewhere over the past year. Uh, conversely, we actually saw with that dislocation in FX rates, um, some borrowers, uh, particularly Chinese and Japanese, were not impacted by a higher rate environment. And they have continued to put capital into the sector over the past two quarters. As to whether that's a long-term sustained trend or just a feature of how quickly the FX rates moved. I think we'll need to wait and see another quarter. Um, but what we've also seen is that the, the long-term shareholders in the space are very cognizant that this is a cyclical business and see this as an opportunity to actually grow their footprint. The difference this time as we look ahead is we see A, there has been consolidation on the platform side, but more importantly, there's also been quite a bit of consolidation on the order book side. And that's actually really helpful in transferring pricing power to lessors over the course of time. Uh, and that's been quite a big trend over the past, I would say, two to three years. And where we also see a behavioral change in the industry 
is with the OEMs, where they're now very mindful of not having a very dispersed or very scattered lessor order book out there. They prefer to deal with a small number of large-scale counterparts rather than the scattergun approach, which they previously had when it came to lessors. Yeah, and I might come back to that OEM point in a minute, which I think is really interesting. If we can focus on the leasing market for a second, a, cup, you know, a thread through what you're talking about really is the importance of scale. Um, scale in any sector in any business is obviously very important. But do you think it, it has taken on a heightened sense of importance in the leasing market over the last couple of years? Absolutely, and I think that access to investment grade ratings is, is sort of the, the bright line test um, where, it, you know, the barrier to get a new platform rated investment grade is probably a bit higher than it was in terms of demonstrating resilience through a cycle. Uh, the high yield market has always been uh, more volatile than investment grade, but we're again seeing evidence of that where non-investment grade borrowers are simply uh, priced out of the market for US public market access. And the industry has become so large and so mainstream, so the thesis of a niche industry being bank financed, growing to become systemic and large scale and becoming uh, wholesale marketing into US public markets has happened. So the consequence of that is that it's very hard to grow a business to be relevant uh, if you're funded in the private markets. Uh, at Avalon, uh, we started out as a bank funded startup and migrated through high yield and through investment grade. At our peak, we were $15 billion business funded exclusively in the bank market. And I don't think the banking capacity is there to do that today. So I think that market has fundamentally changed. It's changed for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is banking regulations. So the allocation of capital is now more expensive for banks. And then secondly is ESG, where European banks were a large part of that financing market uh, for traditional aircraft financing. Uh, that has actually, ESG is driving them to invest more of their resources in next generation technology and newer technology, and they're not tending to grow their aviation portfolios as much as they were. I might come back to the ESG point in just a second. To, to keep it maybe the broader leasing market, if you talk about scale being more important, it, it would, Im and, and you know, the barrier to new platforms being that bit higher, probably points towards more consolidation. Would that be your expectation in, over the medium term within the leasing sector? Yeah, I, it is. I, I think we'll continue to see, particularly in that small to mid-size platform. Uh, Can I, I ask you just one question? What, what is now small to mid-size? Because it, it's kind of like, is it 100 aircraft? Is it 150? Your thoughts on like what what is now scale? Because it, it, it seems to be a lot in flux. Yeah, it, it's moving rapidly as consolidation happens, but you know, I think really 10 billion is your entry ticket now in terms of portfolio size and probably more like 15 actually to have real scale. And, and then more broadly then on the leasing side, what we have seen over the course of COVID, the likes of yourselves have deepened relationships with airlines. Airlines have appreciated the flexibility the leasing offered and we've seen that 50% threshold breached. And obviously airline balance sheets are extremely stressed. Do you think we continue to see an uptick in that percentage of leased aircraft? And just generally, has the pandemic had you know, a sustainable shift in the importance of the leasing channel? Yeah, uh, I think it has. I, I think we will see modest movement in that trend uh, to continue to go upwards a little bit. But actually, I, I think there's natural limitations on it, uh, where uh, you've got markets, for example, the US and for example, China, which are large markets, but they have very efficient onshore financing channels for on balance sheet financing, which is attractive to the airlines in both of those regions. And I expect that will put a, a natural ceiling or cap on that uh, proportion of lessor ownership and market share. Um, the other aspect obviously is there are certain asset types that lessors typically don't want to invest in. And again, that takes out uh, a decent chunk of the addressable market. Um, so, in terms of the value of lessors, I, I think we've certainly seen uh, as demand shifted around the globe, lessors were able to respond to airlines' needs to restructure, respond to airlines' needs for new capital, and respond to the need to redeploy assets from one part of the globe to the other. So I think lessors were a big part of actually smoothing the industry through COVID as they acted uh, in all of those different channels 
uh, a to try and make money, but also uh, to work with our customers to address what the customers needed to to do. Yeah, that's it. I think hugely important in in airline survival, right? And I, I think I don't think that can be underplayed in any way. Um, bringing it back to the ESG point you mentioned. Um, is it having an impact on Avalon's business as of today in a real way with a particular focus, I guess, on the environmental element? Yes. Uh, so, it, you know, clearly we take it seriously. We, uh, we want to be at the forefront of the industry in this. Uh, we published our sustainability report last year, which gave very explicit commitments on our fleet composition uh, over the medium term. So that, that's not a, a 2050 goal. That's a, a 2025 goal in terms of our proportion of new technology aircraft to be in our portfolio. Uh, it's also impacting our customers, right? Our, our customers have disproportionate demand for new technology aircraft uh, driven by their own ESG considerations and driven by consumer behavior uh, in turn. So that's something that we take very seriously both in the short term uh, and in the long term. We also underwent a sustainalytics rating process uh, coming out with a, what we believe is a very strong rating for the sector uh, and a new benchmark effectively for the sector. Uh, so really pleased with the work that we've put into this. Is it impacting our business? Yes, it impacts our investment decisions every day in what assets we're buying. And on that asset front, can you talk to us a little bit about the investment you guys are looking at in Evitals? Sure. Uh, well, the, the investment that we've made uh, in Evitals uh, and continue to look at it. Uh, really interesting space. Okay, and when we came across uh, that opportunity, what we saw was a platform that had built a technology that was really interesting and really compelling, uh, but was low on its path to commercialization. And what we felt we could bring to Vertical was instant access to every airline around the world through our network of airline relationships, which would greatly accelerate Vertical's path to commercializing uh, their story. And that was uh, actually a massive underestimation on our part. What we did not appreciate was the level of interest in airline boardrooms around the world in taking part, getting to know, and being involved in this technology. And uh, how that evolves over time is yet to be seen. There's lots of questions around costing, where it fits uh, into the overall transportation ecosystem. How big is this opportunity? What people are not talking about anymore is can this thing fly? Okay, so people believe this can fly. What people are talking about is how big is the opportunity? And that's a, a, a very different question to um, the more fundamental question. Um, the other really interesting dynamic is, first of all, we we're obviously able to place our entire order book for the vertical units within months uh, of placing that order. We've seen really broad-based take up from, uh, you know, ranging from uh, US majors to Asian flag carriers to Asian low-cost carriers to South American low-cost carriers, so a real mix of airlines getting involved in this and all seeing for them a different business opportunity. What we see in it is first of all, uh, we believe it's part of being one of the first movers into electrification of air travel. So there's a certain knowledge flow network that comes from that. Uh, I mentioned that we underestimated the level of connectivity it brought us with our customers and the level of engagement we got at C-suite level from our customers around the world in engaging with this proposition. So that's a massive benefit uh, for Avalon. And then also an opportunity for early stage investment in what uh, we believe will become quite a large business opportunity to deploy capital over the years. Is it going to interfere with mainline? No. Is it first, first mover advantage into a new field of technology that can in time disrupt other modes of transport? Yes. Uh, so that's where we see the opportunity in it. And really interesting stuff, right, and how it evolves. I think we'll, we'll all be watching closely. Bringing it to the more traditional fleet that you have, can I ask you, you know, if we, this conversation I'm having with lots of people at the moment, you know, if you, if you can invest in anything, it's narrow body new tech, and that's understandable, not the ESG piece you've talked around, um, and just generally good quality assets, high demand. 
Beyond the narrow body new tech space, can I get your thoughts on how the wide body market is evolving? And just is there other investable metal that you guys are still willing to play in? Absolutely. Uh, so actually surprised on the upside with how the wide body market has performed through the course of the last 18 months. And what we saw was a lot of the large wide bodies came out of service, 747s, A380s. And what a lot of those uh, airlines did, who operated those, which tended to be the flags and the majors uh, who had those aircraft, they actually went looking for new technology twin engine wide bodies to go replace that capacity. And these things have a lead time, right? I mean, cabin reconfigs and so on. So actually through 2020 and 2021, we were taking new tech wide bodies out of certain restructuring cases of airlines, but actually finding homes for them with relative ease. So, you know, for example, 787s that came out of Norwegian, for example, A350s that came out of Philippine Airlines. The market found a floor on those units uh, actually pretty well. And we continue to see strong demand actually for those twin engine wide body, new tech wide bodies. The 330 COs, which is our predominant exposure to the uh, older technology wide body. We don't have triple sevens, really. We 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 didn't operate in that, uh, but that market has actually been really interesting. Uh, so that was very weak even before COVID, right? There, there was a lot of supply of A three thirties available, um, and there was a large preponderance towards Asia in the order book uh, for the three thirty. What we've seen over the past year is first of all all of our a330 neos bar two are now placed uh, which is a big change from where we were uh, a couple of years ago and they're what i would call long-term strategic economic placements rather than uh, short-term distressed placements um, on the 330 co market as asia is reopening now we're actually seeing surprisingly positive trends in the lease rates uh, on the 330 COs over the past three to four months, actually. And we expect that trend will continue because as those uh, large markets reopen, the Koreas, Japan, Singapore's, etc., the 330 will continue to be the, the backbone of that fleet. Uh, and we see compelling opportunities now. We're actually uh, voluntarily terminating leases and redeploying those assets elsewhere on more economic terms. Uh, so that's a real change in the 330 market. Also, I think what we will see over the, not necessarily in 2023, but 24, 25, is the induction of the cargo conversion market for the 330. We've seen the impact of that on the 737 800s. Uh, we're a firm believer in the A330 300 from a cargo conversion perspective. We think there just simply isn't an alternative to the 767 replacement that has to happen. And we've taken a a uh, significant position with IAI for their conversion of the A330-300 on a multi-year program. And uh, maybe to pull at that cargo point, um, your thoughts on that market, it has you know, had a step change post-COVID with the development or an increased importance of e-commerce. Do you think that is a sustainable change? It sounds like it's something you think is here to stay in a real way. Absolutely. Uh, e-commerce is here to stay, um, but also you know, as supply chains have become more globalized, more people are used to their fresh fruit and their uh, fresh fish, etc., coming from different parts of the world, um, we expect to continue to see freight demand. Also, the uh, move to twin engine wide bodies well, rather than the four engine wide bodies creates an opportunity for increased f dedicated freighters. Um, so we see significant opportunity for it. We think it is a long term shift. Were we at a cyclical high in freight? Y yes, of course we were uh, in terms of the past year. We all saw the supply chain disruptions. We all saw the premium pricing for ships, for containers, because things were just stuck. Things are moving much better now. So some of the heat has gone out of that. But we never invest for the spot market today. We're looking at the trend five years out, 10 years out, and 15 years out in terms of our expectations. And we fundamentally believe that the freighter market is actually underserved by new capacity going into it. Uh, and that creates the opportunity for us to play in the conversion space in a material and significant way. 
And maybe bringing you back to the OEMs, uh, which we, you made some comments on earlier, can you talk to me about the evolution of the relationships you've seen between lessors and OEMs post-COVID? Yeah, I, I think uh, OEMs had to respond to, to very significant challenges, both in terms of their own production capability, uh, Boeing on the certification side as well, uh, but then also on their customers' ability to actually take delivery of aircraft. And that has been a real change in the behavior of the OEMs. They're now working much more proactively with lessors. They're being much more selective with the lessors that they want supporting their programs. Uh, a great example is the level of cooperation between Airbus, Rolls-Royce and Avalon for the Mal a recent Malaysian Airlines 20 widebody uh, placement program. You know, that level of cooperation and activity and that strategic perspective uh, didn't exist that often. It did in, in spot cases pre-COVID, but I think now as more and more of the order book is taken by lessors, as more and more of the financing for new deliveries is taken by lessors, lessors clearly have a bigger and more meaningful voice at the table with the manufacturers. And also, I think it's fair to say the, the relationship with the engine OEMs is also different now, where the uh, we talked about earlier the the scale of the engine maintenance cost as a component of overall aircraft value, and the uh, airlines look at that as well. So aircraft ownership cost is often determined by engine campaigns, and uh, you know we have seen a couple of airlines actually decide uh, for Airbus narrowbodies to do the engine campaign before the uh, airframe campaign so that they could drive the best cost uh, between the engine uh, OEMs. So that dynamic has changed as well. And we've also seen quite significant changes in behavior from the engine OEMs around expansion of fixed price maintenance contracts, around how they deal with roll-off aircraft, et cetera. And in general, I, I think the engine OEMs perspective is quite aligned with lessors. And, and maybe keeping with the OEMs, both on the aircraft and the engine side, Look, the supply chain challenges of their post-COVID, some of the technology issues with, with the newer engines and delays that are coming. How challenging is that for you, new CEO, planning for growth, that, that, that OEM delays? How worried are you that that's going to be a significant impediment, one, to your general growth, and two, just to the general trading environment, which seems to have a bit of a clog at the moment? Yeah, so uh, it has been a huge issue. Um, it has actually disrupted airline business models, I think, more than uh, lessor business models. Lessors are better able to cope uh, with that. But for airlines, I mean, put simply, if you were an Airbus operator, you were getting deliveries, albeit late. If you were a Boeing operator, you were losing market share. Um, that's become, that has become a problem for a number of customers. Uh, and the uncertainty around both manufacturers, around when you'll actually get the aircraft, is causing now a massive ripple effect. It is easing, so I think we are through uh, through the gap on that one, so to speak, and I expect to see that normalize over 2023 and 2024, in part because the OEMs are now better at managing expectations, right? So, so they are not over-promising. They are trying to manage expectations to a new base case and a new reality. That's helpful, but people still want the aircraft for when they ordered it. And particularly now with demand so strong for near-term deliveries, um, there, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, table bashing and finger pointing going on in lots of tables uh, and meeting rooms around the manufacturers. Um, and just in, in closing, Andy, we, we've talked to there, lots of opportunities in the market, but, but significant uncertainties and, and challenges that are there. As you look out into 2023, what are your optimism levels like? Hi, uh, I think we're in an environment where as a lessor, uh, not unique to us, but lessors have aircraft and they have money, they have capital and they have access to capital. And as we look out at 2023, the things that people want are aircraft and capital. And we've seen airlines cost of capital increase disproportionate to lessors and disproportionate again to investment grade lessors. So I think for our sector, uh, I, I think we are well positioned to take advantage of that. I also think more broadly, just from a human perspective, okay, think back to this time last year. And here in Ireland and in the rest of the world, we were heading into an Omicron wave driven lockdown. And people did not know that summer 2022 would happen. 
uh, we got lucky and most of the world it did. But now people are looking ahead to 2023 with conviction that if I book that conference, if I host that customer event, if I plan that family holiday, it's going to happen. And that gives a level of confidence through the whole system that underpins demand, consumer behavior, airline behavior, and aircraft financing behavior. Andy, on that optimistic note, I'd like to thank you for your insights. I'd congratulate you again uh, on your appointment to CEO, and I wish you and Avalon a very successful 2023.